Have a seat on your porcelain throne. It's time to talk some shit on the Powell Movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and first and foremost, I want to wish everyone a happy new year. Hopefully 2022 will be a big improvement from 2021 and life will continue to get back to normal, but I doubt that's going to happen as the virus, while it never went anywhere, is back and it's spreading more than ever. And since I'm recording this intro on December 30th, I have one more big sketchy event to get through in 2021. My lovely wife and I are spending our anniversary and my birthday seeing Dave Chappelle and friends, and I hope that I not only don't get sick, but that I have as much fun at the show as I did at Mission Ridge this past week. I need to give a big thank you to Tony Hickok. He's an awesome and busy dude, and he took time out of his busy life to show me and my son the best of Mission Ridge and Wenatchee. And man, while that mountain is like three hours from Seattle and it only has four lifts and two rope toes, it felt way bigger than it was, and it had no lines, a variety of terrain that will keep everyone happy. It was awesome and really cold, like zero degrees cold, and we still had a blast. It's one of those places where if I lived closer, I would be stoked to call it my home mountain. It has that mom and pop vibe that takes the whole experience back to another time. It's totally worth checking out for a weekend. But really, my home mountain is the summit at Snoqualmie, and that has that old school vibe too, and they're an hour from Seattle, making them the smart choice for Seattleites who want to play in the mountains. It's easy, convenient, and while things aren't perfect there, they have staffing shortages just like everybody else in the world, they happen to be very good at communicating what will be closed and why. And while that can be frustrating, I get it. It's a weird time in the world. What I don't get is what's going on with Vail Resorts' crown jewel of Washington State, Stevens Pass. This is a place that people used to bleed for. A group that once had a guy named Chris Rudolph running the marketing. A guy who not only loved his great job, but loved his mountain, his peers, and his community. And everybody else was that way as well. And unfortunately, I feel like when we lost Chris to an avalanche, part of the soul of Stevens Pass died. And while that was terrible, these days, the rest of the mountain's soul has been stolen by a corporation. Gone are every single person who bled for that place. All the great people who I loved working with, who were fired in the name of Synergy. And what the mountain has become is really a joke. Its operations have been a case study in how greed can ruin a once proud mountain in three years. With the price reduction of Vail's Epic Pass, they've sold more passes and generated more revenue than ever before. But with corporations, those profits are passed on to the shareholders and not always invested in where it needs to be. In this case, Vail has all the loyal pass holders by the balls and they are laughing all the way to the bank. They can't open on time and when they do get open, it's with limited lifts and terrain. They blame staffing, they blame power, and they blame everything they possibly can. But if you look at the other Washington mountains, while they may face similar staffing issues, and I'm sure power's an issue, and all kinds of different things, they all seem to be operating 100% better than Stevens Pass. I mean, Stevens has plenty of snow, but the backside isn't open, and rumors are the backside might not open this whole season. That's a huge concern, but it's the little shit that's even more concerning not plowing the already too limited parking situation, which has always been a nightmare, not clearing out the porta potties so there's shit and piss everywhere, not paying a living wage to employees, the lack of employee housing, which existed to some extent before Vail took over, but they also fired every single person in the company that had institutional knowledge. And the lack of communication about it all? Well, that's what makes everything so frustrating. No one can get an answer to any of their questions and they're stuck driving to a place where they can't even get in the parking lot they're turned around and it's just a frustrating day after day after day. New stuff comes out. And I don't know, it's insane that a company that has the deep pockets of bail has the ability to overpromise and underdeliver, and pass holders have to deal with it. At the end of the day, there are more lifts and more terrain open at the summit and you can always find parking and the vibe is so much better than the disease that Stevens Pass has turned into. And I, like everyone else, is hoping that things will change. But based on the track record of what Vail's done, I don't see them investing in anything that Stevens Pass needs in the near future. But who knows? Hopefully they will prove me wrong. My guest this week proved everyone wrong by having an incredible long ski career. And to bring it back to the whole Vail thing, Mark Abba is a local at one of Vail's premier resorts, Whistler Blackcomb. And I'm sure, like all the other former athletes of Whistler Blackcomb, 
Mark Adma probably doesn't get a free pass from Vale because I don't feel like Vale gives out too many free passes these days. But who cares about a free pass? Mark Adma can afford it as he's a man of many different parts. Badass athlete, new age healer, farm boy, hippie, businessman, dreamer. There are so many different parts about Mark Adma that haven't been talked about until now. And before Mark and I chat, I want to ask you to start 2022 with a star rating of the podcast on Spotify. I'm going to give you detailed instructions on how to do that in the outro. I also want to ask you to support my incredible sponsors who are making season six happen. Yes, I said season six, which means six years since I've had a real full-time job. It's incredible, and I probably work more hours than I would at a real job with this podcast, but it's a passion project, and I thank you guys for listening, and I want to thank these great sponsors who support it. They are Stanley, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, Elon Skis, Alpine Vans, and the Ten Barrel Brewery. Now, let's talk to Mark Emma. Last year, you went on a trip with Carl Fosfett, Sam Cooch, and Logan Pahoda, and you're the old guy, Uncle Abma. Yeah. <laughs> and it's almost like the time you went to Bella Coola with McConkie, Hugo Harrison. I think Ingrid might have been there when you were the dude coming up. And on that first trip you went on with them, you're super green. What were the things that you learned from that crew back then? Well, I learned how to pick a line, first and foremost. And with regards to that, just learning risk management, where to put yourself for plan A and then having a plan B in case of a slide pops and then having a plan C. So those are just kind of the basic fundamentals. And then beyond that, there's slough management. And then at the end of the day, you know, I was hanging out with McConkie. So fun was number one. Yeah, totally, man. How many trips did you get to go on with McConkie during your career? Because he's one of those guys that everybody wanted to travel with. That was the one and only trip I got to do, actually. You get that one. Is there some highlight moments from McConkie that stand out now that you look back and laugh at? Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, I wouldn't call it a laughing moment, but a holy shit moment was when he skied down that massive spine and then launched off the, I don't know, call it a five, 600 footer and pulled the parachute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And when you see that, does that ever make you want to do anything like that? Or you look at him like, that dude's crazy. No, he's, he's in a world of his own. And I would say I'm maybe a little bit more conservative than that. And I'm totally okay with that. Yeah. And then in thinking of people that have had a big part in shaping you when you were an early skier, I think you had a boat trip with Darren Ralves and Davenport back in the day. Is that another trip where you're a sponge and you're learning from some older veterans at that point? Yeah, and actually speaking of McConkie, he was supposed to be on that trip, but he had just dislocated his hip or torn his ACL just prior. And I happened to be in the area, so that was kind of the next guy in line. So yeah, I ended up with Davenport and Rolfs, both legends in their own respect, and Davenport, of course, being more so in the extreme skiing side of the uh, the scene. And so he definitely took me to school and showed me showed me the ropes, and he definitely got onto some lines that I didn't want to touch on that trip. And it's funny to hear that lines that you wouldn't want to touch because when you think about yourself now or over the years, it doesn't seem like there's many lines that you wouldn't touch. But <laughs> Dab showing you them back then. And who are the other dudes that really help you learn the big mountains? Because when you get out there, it's like you come from being like a mogul guy to a park guy into the big mountains. It all happens pretty quickly. Are there any other guys that take you under their wing? You know, I think it would go back a little bit further than that with regards to guys that just took me to the backcountry initially and that would bring me back to Bornowski, JP and Julian and those guys taught me a lot with regards to just access just getting out there with regards to snowmobiling which I didn't have a clue with what I was doing and then building jumps and once again risk assessment. When I think of that crew I mean we're going to get to you living with them later on but just in talking about them teaching you, and I wouldn't even say it's them teaching you. You guys were all like the first wave of the Whistler guys getting into the backcountry back then. It was like Shane Zox and the guys that you just mentioned, they all got sleds and they're like, we're going to figure this backcountry stuff out. We have so many zones and there weren't as many rules back then. And you were by association living with those dudes. So you're heading out there. And are you the one who doesn't know how to work a sled? Are you the weak link in the beginning? Or is everybody bad? <laughs> I'm sure there was a lot of weak links for sure. But I came along a little bit later than the initial crew of being Zox and Douglas and even going back to like McDonnell and, and that whole crew that was first going out there. 
And when I first moved to Whistler, that's when I was watching State of Mind and Degeneres and 13, and they were already out there doing that, you know, and that's when I was still mobile skiing. So then when I did finally have the opportunity to jump in with JP and Julian and Anthony, then uh, they were there years ahead of me already. And so I was just the, uh, the guy trying to keep up. Right. And then you look at it these days, you're 20 years or so into an incredible ski career, and you're going out with all these young bucks. Do you feel like the old man skiing with those kids? Sometimes, for sure. I had a moment this year where I definitely felt like an old man, where I just got broken off. But the level of skiing now is, is so high, and I think what's really cool about it is just the, the consistency that comes along with it. And I would say the professionalism, you know, they're not just hucking their meat. They're super precise, super dialed. And even though they're throwing crazy tricks, they're stomping more often than not, which I can't say that I was doing back in the day. Yeah, I mean, just the one cliff that I saw Logan do this year, it was like his highlight clip. (laughs) It's just fucking ridiculous. And then everything Sam does is just like so loose and on the edge at times, but he's like in control the whole time as well. It's so exciting to watch those guys ski. And when you see that, does that push you to even want to push yourself? Absolutely. Every time I watch a good segment, I get so motivated for the, the upcoming winter. So it's it's really rad to be able to ski alongside these people that are motivating me. And, you know, at the end of the day, they're good people, you know, they're, they're rad to hang out with and people that I just enjoy spending time with. But can you see them look to you for guidance like they know you have the wisdom from your years out in the mountains? Yeah, especially on that trip when we all went to Revy. Like with with Cooch, Logan, and Carl. Like I think Logan had been on a heli trip before, but I don't think Sam and Carl had spent too much time in that kind of terrain. And so they were definitely asking questions with regards to terrain management and whatnot. And the proof is in the pudding. I mean, they <laughs> just with regards to their natural ability, they really didn't bat an eye at much of anything, you know. And I think it's it's such a fun age to be at because ignorance is definitely a bit of bliss there. Yeah. <laughs> you don't really understand the consequences yet. And so you put yourself in the crazier situations. And thankfully for them, they've got the skills to back up their, their crazy ideas. Yeah, it's amazing to watch them ski. And they're all established professionals that for the most part are early in their careers. I mean, Carl's been around for a while, but the other two are kind of earlier in their careers, it feels like. And do you have any advice for those guys? I mean, do they look to you like, hey, what should I do with this? What should I do with money? Do they ask those kind of questions or do they just kind of live? I was definitely getting a little bit of questions just with regards to trying to figure out how to manage sponsorship and whatnot. And they're all pretty independent dudes, you know, like Logan's boss. Yeah. Sam, definitely, he's got a pretty good understanding of self-awareness. And then Carl, you know, as you mentioned, he's been around the block, so... They would ask a few questions, but I think they just, they kind of know what's going on. They didn't need as much guidance as you did when you were younger. Well, I I think we all need a certain amount of guidance, but I think, you know, we're all in an independent sport. And I think you develop a pretty good understanding of who you are just by doing that, just by nature. I think that's kind of the beautiful thing about the sport that we're in. You know, it's like, it's a very humbling sport. And so with that, you're looking to your elders and whatnot, but at the same time, you're confident in your own abilities. Yeah, that makes sense. And before you're a skier, you grew up in Langley, BC. And from what I've heard about your childhood is you grew up, your dad is Sid. And he's not from Texas, but he should be because everything Sid does is Sid size. It's bigger than life. And like if he was yes. going to build you a bike track, it was going to be the biggest bike track in Langley. And give me some examples of what Sid size means. Well, I guess when I was younger... He built this swing set for us that was massive, and it was fastened to the top of a barn, so you could crawl up the the side of the swing set, and then you had a walkway along the top of this thing, and it was like 30 feet into the air, and then you could (laughs) go and stand on top of this barn, and I was literally like four years old at this point, (laughs) and I guess everything he did, yeah, he had a big vision, you know, whether it was like building waterways or ponds or like the house that we grew up in. He's just always the guy that kind of has to, he's a big dreamer. And that's definitely where I get, you know, as I get older, I just realize that I'm more and more like him. And I am a big dreamer. And, you know, as I'm getting into more and more building now myself, I'm realizing how much I'm like him. And now that, you know, he's living in California now. And I went down there back in the day and I was always kind of the grunt around the house, you know. So I was the guy that was kind of helping build the Sid Size Dream Projects. 
So you're in the shop with him a lot and just doing a ton of work with your dad? Yeah, exactly. I was a welder's helper. You know, as soon as I was strong enough to be able to pick up a grinder, because my dad was a welder. And so after you do every weld, you have to grind off the excess schmeg. Yep. And so I was that guy. And so I did that until I was in my early 20s working on job sites with him. And so for a number of years, I used to live on the job site with him down in California. We just lived in an RV down there. And I was the guy that packed pipe and just kind of set up pipe all around the greenhouses. And then he would follow behind and weld thousands of feet of pipe. Man, I used to have so many good packed pipe jokes, but I'm not going to bring any of those out these days. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds like it's a total blue collar kind of farm boy type life in Canada. He's installing ventilation systems and he's a welder and you're working your ass off with him. And I guess yeah. that's what breeds your strong work ethic. Because when I talk to people, I talk to a bunch of people about you for this podcast. And everyone had to say that you have a stronger work ethic than anybody else that you can possibly meet. Like, You'll work from 8 in the morning to 8 p.m. with your hands working hard. And then you'll do business stuff on the computer till like midnight. And you're not afraid to work hard. It's always been that way for you? I think I'm growing more and more into that. But looking back on it, that's definitely how I was raised. You know, whether it was my dad or my mom and her side of the family, because they own greenhouses. And so they were, they were growing food, which is an insane amount of work. They were raising cattle as well. So between my mom's side of the family, my dad's side of the family, they were all super hard workers. And I think that's definitely what's helped me a lot in skiing. I think all of a sudden that work ethic just kind of got triggered in me. It wasn't something that I had when I was sitting in, in class, that's for sure. But I think as soon as I found something that I was passionate about, then all of a sudden that just got turned on in me. And I think as soon as I'm passionate about something, then yeah, I can work you know, endless hours and have endless stoke for it. When you think about that over time, because you've worked with people, I'm sure that don't have that same passion or that same work ethic, and they want to be done three hours earlier, like I would be. And when you think of the hardest working ski athletes in the business, who else works as hard as you when you're like, oh, I'm going to bring this guy because I know he'll be working with me the whole time? Well, some of the people that I love to work with are uh, Hoji and Rubens, good Canadian boys that love to work hard and i mean they work harder than i do they definitely put me to shame when it comes to shoveling snow and just doing the duties that not everybody wants to do they're the first people to do it huh so i, I definitely learn a lot from those guys but i think just in the industry in general like tanner is definitely probably the hardest working person that that i know of yeah man he's a machine it's pretty amazing to see all the work that he puts in and then the people that don't realize it just look at him like oh he's some punk and it's like no dude He's the hardest working athlete in skiing, and you just don't realize it. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, working hard in the shop is one thing, but when you're growing up, are there any team sports, or what's Little Abma doing? Oh, I was playing soccer for a little bit. I did a little bit of skateboarding, a little bit of rollerblading, a little bit of mountain biking. I wasn't really too into anything. It, it really wasn't until a scene came along that, this infatuation came about in me as soon as I first got onto skis. And I didn't get on skis until I was 10 years old. I know, it's crazy. And as soon as I did, that's all of a sudden when that light bulb went off me. And I just, I just wanted to get more and more and more laps. And that's when I discovered ski magazines and I just couldn't stop staring at them. You know, I just covered my walls in it and that became my world. And when you think about being that Grom who's covering the walls in magazines, who were the people that stuck out to you back then? Did you have like two or three skiers that you wanted to be? Scott Schmidt initially. That's a good one. Yeah, everything about him was something that I, I mimicked. And then, you know, with that Glenn Plake, and then it kind of transferred to Seth Morrison. Seth was definitely like a style that I tried to mimic as much as possible when I was growing up skiing at Hemlock Valley. Yeah, and so you get into skiing, you go on a, a family vacation with some friends at 10. You do one trip a year until you're 14. And then you start going to Hemlock, and that's when you're put on the freestyle team. Is that when you really, really get hooked in the sport where you want to be doing it every single day? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all of a sudden, I had an opportunity to become a weekend warrior. For the first season, it was just every Saturday. And so just that kind of consistency, and then all of a sudden hanging out with my freestyle coach. And we had a small team. I think there was like five or six of us. But nonetheless, I was all of a sudden surrounded by other like-minded individuals that all wanted to learn. And all of a sudden, we had a, 
quote unquote, like a safe place to huck, you know, even though we were just jumping off cat tracks, there was no terrain parks or anything back then. But now I had a coach that kind of taught me how to jump. And, you know, all of a sudden started showing me how to do like Cossacks and iron crosses and all these things that, uh, they're cool back then. They were rad back then. Yeah. And it was just something new at that point. And then the following year, um, my parents, they got a cabin at Hemlock Valley. And then all of a sudden, you know, I was up there Friday afternoon so I could go night skiing and then ski Saturday and Sunday. When they get the cabin, is that when you're able to get out of the boundary of the mountain and kind of just explore the back country a little bit or the side country that's right around the resort? Yeah, that's exactly it. I think at that point, all of a sudden, I was spending enough time on the mountain that I started looking outside of the mountain. And I think just by looking at ski magazines and watching movies, I started seeing the kind of terrain that they were skiing. And so that's when I started looking out for spine zones and for little pillows or looking for couloirs. And luckily, our tiny little hill had little pockets of that surrounding the ski area. And so I would usually kind of rally a couple of my buddies and ditch out on freestyle. And then we would go duck the ropes and go climbing around we didn't have any packs or beacons or shovels or anything like that you know we were just kind of young and dumb and just exploring and having the best time did you ever get in any trouble for ducking ropes or being where you weren't supposed to be you know what i didn't really get any trouble with the ski resort i guess i was pretty sneaky about it but i remember i brought at one point i brought my whole freestyle team out there (laughs) and i had found this little zone called grand marnier and it was this little fluted area and all of a sudden i quickly realized that my team was in over their head and kids were flailing and falling and my coach was getting pissed off and i guess it kind of reminded me after that that maybe you know it's just going to be a thing between me and a couple buddies and luckily i had a couple buddies that were usually keen to go walk around with me and go hiking around and you know at that point i was so influenced just by people like Scott Schmidt that I lived it and I breathed it. And, you know, I would go to school wearing like my ski backpack. I was that kid, you know, and then when I was back in the mountains or just taking the bus to school, all I was doing was staring at the mountains. Yeah. So then when I would get back into the mountains, I was just so hungry at that point, you know, like where I skied, it rains a lot, unfortunately, or fortunately, you know, weather didn't affect me. It didn't, bother me if I got wet or if the snow was shit, you know, I was just uh, like when everybody else is going inside because it's miserable, you were still out there lapping. Yeah, exactly. And people thought you were crazy. Like, dude, he's out there and it's raining. I didn't even know a difference. You know, I was just like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Right. Yeah. And I guess, you know, like just as a little side note, what I think was pretty interesting and I didn't learn about this until a few years ago, I met up with the guy that started Hemlock Valley Freestyle Club. I went to the registration at some library near to where I grew up. And while I was registering, he asked me why I wanted to join freestyle. And I told him because I wanted to be in a Warren Miller ski movie. And this is when I was 14. (laughs) That's crazy. Yeah. And it was kind of interesting because I think it was about 10 years later that I was in a Warren Miller movie. And I, I didn't remember saying that at that point, but it's kind of interesting how when you create a dream for yourself or a vision for yourself, you know, if you're fixated on it enough and you work hard enough that it'll come true. Yeah. And you know, it's funny because I talked to a bunch of people about your mogul skiing before maybe you even had this Warren Miller dream. And it sounds like you weren't even the most naturally gifted skier out there. It's like you had some potential, but you had to work (laughs) so much harder than everybody else to even get the same results as them. Did you notice that right away? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I never got the best results. So I think that was always made it pretty clear that I wasn't the best out there. And then growing through the sport, especially when I started getting into park skiing, you just see how some people can learn a trick really quickly. And I wasn't that guy. You know, I was definitely crashing super hard and I wasn't and I still I'm not good on a trampoline. And so that would have been a great place for me to be able to to learn these tricks. And so I kind of took to the water ramps, you know, that's where I could practice these tricks and crash and not get completely broken. Okay. And then luckily I had friends that were transitioned to becoming freestyle coaches and they had access to these old aerial sites that were kind of being transformed to the place where we had big air kickers. And so we start the day off by chopping landings and then I I could continue to 
<laughs> go through my awkward phase of learning where I, I had a safe place to crash more or less and then eventually I'd figure it out. Now it's time for my first sponsor break and I'm going to start things off with Peter Glenn Ski and Sports. Peter Glenn has been getting people out there for over 60 years and whether you're going on vacation or a weekend warrior or ski or ride every day, Peter Glenn has all the brands, all the deals, a knowledgeable staff, a price matching policy and free shipping on orders of $49 or more. If you're listening to this podcast and need gear, please do me a favor and head on over to peterglenn.com. They have all the deals, and by buying from them, you are supporting the show and keeping it going. So please check out peterglenn.com. Next up, it's Elon Skis. I've been skiing my Ripstick 96 Black Editions a ton lately. And man, those things are so quick edge to edge. And while 96 is narrower than anything I've skied in a while, I totally back them on the not-so-deep days, and on hard snow, they make you ski like a rock star. When my kid told me something looked different about my skiing, I knew it was more about the skis than it was me. And if you want to go wider and get out there more, Elon and Glenn Plake have the Ripstick 106 Tour. Finally, a Plake Pro model that has all the personality of a Ripstick at a fraction of the weight. Glenn spent eight months designing and testing these to ensure they deliver the perfect blend of uphill efficiency and downhill performance. Head on over to elonskis.com to learn more about the design process directly from Glenn. My final sponsor is the Ten Barrel Brewery out of Bend, Oregon. They've been brewing the Northwest's best beer since 2006, and they also live a life of skiing, snowboarding, and biking, and of course, drinking their beer outside. The folks at Ten Barrel also support more in snow and bike than any brand I can think of, and their world-class team of athletes speaks for itself with names like Ben Ferguson, Lucas Wax, Carson Storch, Kate Zeleff, and more. But the best thing about Ten Barrel is the beer, and while I'm a huge fan of their new Pilsner, one that I haven't tried, but I'm going to, is the Pray for Pow beer. It's Ten Barrel's most awarded beer ever, and since I haven't had it, it's going to be my next six-pack I pick up at the store. I think you should do the same when you're at the store, and to find out more about Ten Barrel and all their beers, events, and pubs, head on over to tenbarrel.com. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. In terms of like your mogul career in high school, I mean, do you start traveling to mogul comps at that point? Yeah, I was doing some provincial events just throughout British Columbia, you know, mainly club events. So I kind of got a, a bit of a taste of, of competing, which was really good for me because when I was younger, I used to compete in track and field. And I remember getting so, so nervous. So you did do something. You did track and field. Track and field. Yeah. I guess I was a long distance kid. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I used to do like 1500 meter and cross country and whatnot. Maybe that was the one thing I was good at. Just because of your work ethic, Sid could run for 26 miles. He <laughs> would, too. Yeah, it's kind of funny because I was always the shortest kid in class. And cross-country kids were generally the tall, lanky kids. Right. You're like the stocky short kid? Oh, totally, man. It was so funny. I, was, I looked so awkward. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but back to moguls, are you getting on the podium eventually? No. <laughs> no, I'm <not. laughs> no, I'm still just kind of fighting, you know, just kind of get into top five or top 10. But uh, throughout that whole time, I'm just being taught work ethic. I had an amazing coach named Rob Cober, and he just taught me how to train in the gym and taught me how to train on the hill. But I think even going back before that, I had another coach, Emil Van Dunn, and he taught me how to visualize. And that was something I definitely took with me to this very day. You know, it's been such an important process just with learning a trick is standing at the top of the in-run and seeing yourself doing it. Yeah, I would think between learning a trick and today when you're visualizing your line and you're looking at the pictures of what you need to do, I mean, it, it comes into play in everything that you do when you're skiing. Yeah. But the one thing I did hear about those trips back then when you're going on, on contests is there was one where maybe you missed a flight or a bus and you almost ended up freezing to death in a sleeping bag. What's the story behind that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Josh and I, we were trying to make our way up to Fortress Mountain, I believe. And yeah, I don't know how it happened. I mean, it happens, I guess. You miss your flight. And somehow we end up hitching a ride from Calgary to the junction for Fortress, which doesn't bring you anywhere. You're still like 80 kilometers from the resort. <laughs> the junction, do you just get dropped off on the road? We got dropped off on the road, yeah, on the side of uh, the Trans-Canada Highway. And we ended up bunking up there for, I'm not even sure how long anymore. We didn't have cell phones back then. <laughs> so, yeah, we just kind of bumped up, not really knowing how long we're going to be stuck out there for. I mean, it was pretty cold from what I hear, too. Like negative 30. Oh, 
Yeah, Calgary's freezing cold, man. <laughs> so you guys are out on the street, negative 30 degrees with ski bags, and that's it? And you got to figure out how to get 80 kilometers away? Yeah, I think we just kind of hung out and waited until eventually someone came along. Because there was a competition happening up there, we knew that eventually somebody was going to be driving by that was going to be going that direction. And so they saved the day you get picked up. And <laughs> while you say you weren't a podium guy or anything like that in Moguls, by the time you're in grade 12, it's like 1998. Your dad's planning on moving to California for work and the whole family's going to move. And I don't know if you're considering this or not, but in a stroke of luck or fate or whatever you want to call it, you get a call from the BC freestyle coach and he wants to put you on the BC freestyle team or he wants to bring you to a, a camp in Canada. There are 10 people that are going to be on that team and you are number 10. Is that like the call of a lifetime right there? Like, hey, I'm about to go to California or have to figure out life. And then I get a call to go to BC for this training camp. Yeah, you know, there again, I had a, another great coach. His name's Jeff Fairbairn. And he was the one that kind of planted that seed. And he spoke with the BC team coach saying, hey, I've got a kid that I think would be a, a good fit. And so that's what took me to Whistler that summer where I got to be a part of that training camp and then ultimately ended up on the team which was a dream come true. And it kind of happened, you know, in the final hour. But, you know, it brought me to Whistler, which was always a very intimidating resort for me because it's so much bigger than my home hill. And kind of like when I was 14, all of a sudden I had that crew of five or six people to ski with. Now I was surrounded by 10 or 12 others that were the best in the province, and they were all better than me. <laughs> so there again, you know, I'm just kind of forced to learn and try to keep up you feel like you almost don't belong at first and you just have to try harder? 100%. Yeah, absolutely. You know, half the team was the guys that were active competitors within a bigger circuit. And so, yeah, they knew how to turn better than I did. They had better tricks than I did. But at the same time, there was a good amount of support there. Like everybody's giving each other shit there. There was a lot of support. So it was, it was super fun. And then that next year, I finally moved to Whistler. And, you know, I was with people like Rex Thomas, who was, you know, definitely leading the charge back then. But there was a whole crew of us that we were all watching State of Mind Degenerates and watching all the new tricks that were being created. And so anytime we weren't training in moguls, we were going back up on the hill and building jumps and, and hucking our meat. And when you say you're with Rex Thomas, I look at you and Rex as some of the bigger, more cut guys, because I think Rex is pretty big, too. Did you just hang out with all the muscly skiers? Well, we trained super hard, man. We were in the gym five days a week. And yeah, our, our coach, Rob Cobra, he definitely got us pretty strong so that we could ski the very best that he thought we could in mogul skiing. And he created the body types that he thought was the best for mogul skiing. So the Canadian mogul team walking around Whistler was a bunch of little tanks. <laughs> totally, man. We were all on creatine and... We were all trying to get jacked, for sure. <laughs> really, do you have dreams of making the Olympic team for moguls, or are you almost using moguls to get the skill set to move on to the next level on your way to being a pro skier? Like, what's your thought process with that? Yeah, I was definitely, that was the, the motivation at that point, was the next step being get to national team. And then, of course, once you're national team, then you kind of move towards getting onto the Olympic team. But I think it was pretty interesting, because just by moving to Whistler, yeah, I was focused on mogul skiing, but all of a sudden it gave me an opportunity to start skiing in bigger mountains. And just the shit that you're seeing. I mean, a lot of the dudes that left moguls, they're on the glacier, especially that first summer. I think JP, JF, Anthony, I think Tanner's on the glacier at like 13. And are you seeing those dudes do shit that you never had seen of or thought of before when you get to Whistler? Yeah, absolutely. All of a sudden I was surrounded by people that I looked up to. I remember... That first year on the mogul team, we saw this guy cruising by with 1080s. We're like, oh, who's that guy? He had all the dope gear on, so we kind of followed him down into the park. And there was a tabletop like right at the top of the park, and he hopped the switch and threw a switch backy. And we're like, who the hell is that guy? <laughs> Turned out it was Flew Poirier. And this is before anybody knew who Flew was. So your mind's just blown. Like, you haven't seen that before ever. Oh, mind blown. Yeah, totally. And there was a lot of moments like that where there was a lot of people that were up and coming, like the three fills. All of a sudden, there's these three guys just crushing it. We're like, who the hell are these guys? And then the next year, you see them in Poor Boys. And so it was pretty cool. And then, you know, eventually I 
started to get into the competitive circuit. And then all of a sudden, you know, now I'm standing next to the Mikel Deschanaux and the Tanners and the CRs. And yeah, I just kind of feel like I got thrown into the lines then. And I never felt like I was totally prepared. I was always just kind of just off the back, you know, but I was there. And so I just kind of made the most of it. Yeah, well, you were a few years behind because it's not like you could quit the Canadian team because you're part of that BC freestyle team. And that winter, you're traveling to shitty conditions to compete in moguls while all your buddies, the Whistler crew, they're reinventing the sport with shit that you wanted to be doing and skiing powder as well. Is that frustrating for you when you're on the East Coast skiing in negative 20 degrees and you're looking at the forecast and they're going to get 40 centimeters in Whistler? Yeah, that was it. You know, I always felt like I was a year behind because obviously I was focused on mogul skiing. But meanwhile, you're watching all these new tricks come out in the, the films and so then that spring after the mogul season was done, then we would go spend a month or two in the park and start trying to learn all these tricks that we'd just seen in the past ski film. And so I never really felt like I was able to get on top of it with regards to trick progression. And then eventually after three years of skiing moguls, and like you said, spending a lot of time in the East Coast skiing icy cold mogul courses, I realized I, I got to just make the leap of faith and dedicate myself just to skiing park. But when you're about to make that leap of faith and dedicate yourself, I mean, you've been skiing moguls and whistlers for a couple seasons, and it's like 2002-ish or something. And I believe you were offered a spot on the Canadian national team, but you turned it down. Is that true? Yeah, I, I was definitely at that opportunity where I could have continued on and moved forward in that direction. That's like a dream come true for so many people if they're offered a spot there. So I can think that some people might have been bummed that you didn't take the opportunity, especially coaches. Yeah, I really don't even remember anybody being bummed. <laughs> you know, I think at that point, it was, you know, there's always so much transition happening in the sport. And I guess at that point, I had already been in the off season showing so much dedication and passion towards this other avenue of sport. And so I think people saw me just naturally gravitating that way and almost saw it as being just kind of a natural part of my progression. And I would think too that at that point, you can see the path to skiing like that, where maybe five years earlier, there was no path because no one really knew what skiing twin tips was going to be all about because it was so new. But by the time that you make the switch, it's like you can have a career doing that. And given it's just starting, but you can see that there's a future in it. Yeah, that's exactly it. Because I remember talking with my dad about it. And saying, hey, there's people like Candy Thovex that, you know, they're actually making money doing this. And so I definitely kind of set my eyes on the prize as far as trying to get to that place where I can make a career for myself, where I could actually put a roof over my head. So it's like you have this supreme confidence in your decision. And it's like you have Sid-sized goals. Like you're going to be this badass in the free skiing world and you're going to make it happen. Do you have any doubters out there? Um... <laughs> Like, Mark, what are you doing? Yeah, it was more my family. They were definitely my biggest supporters. But at the same time, they were kind of like, when are you going to get a real job? Right. You know, and so that came from my grandparents. And even though my parents supported me, they were, you know, kind of seen as being this temporary thing. But I was always just so motivated. And at the end of the day, just stoked on the idea of, at that point, even though I was skiing in Parkton, like ultimately I knew I wanted to get into skiing big mountains and I just had my vision kind of set on that. And so I think just having those sid size goals, you know, like skiing in Alaska, even though at that point I was nowhere near ready or having the means to be able to do that, that's where my eyes were set on. So what do you do? Just suck it up, get a couple jobs, find a cheap place in Whistler and ski your face off and then good things are going to happen out of that? Yeah, totally. <laughs> That's basically it. Yeah, I found a, a futon to sleep on for 200 bucks a month. And I shared that place with two girls that, you know, they lived in the one room and I had a crazy cat that ran around and kept me up all night. And I worked at Komar Ski Shop in Whistler and I was a coach for the Black Home Free Salt Club on the weekends. And to be honest, it was like a bit of a struggle because Komar had me kind of working during the days and then Black Home Free Salt had me working the weekends and I wasn't skiing as much as I wanted to. And then just by doing these little uh, local big air events and slope events and pipe events, you know, I remember the first time I won a thousand bucks. I was like, that's it. I'm quitting my job. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I 
committed myself to skiing every single day and just lap in the park more or less. And Blackham is so well set up, whereas you can hit the park and the pipe all in one lap. Yeah. Was it the Nintendo park back then? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, great memory. And I'm not 100% on this, but I feel like you might have gone to the X Games for ski cross at one point and had your ass handed to you, but I'm not 100%. What's the story behind that? I didn't do ski cross X Games, but I did a couple of ski cross events in Japan back in the day. And was that going to be like a thing for you? Did you try that after you were on the mogul team? Is that kind of the in between? No, it was never a focus. It was just, I used to go to Japan with one of my original ski sponsors, Gravity Clothing and Fisher Skis. And I used to go out there with Zox and Oakley White Allen and Chris Turpin. And we get brought out for these competitions that were primarily focused around big air. But back then, ski cross was still kind of new and an upcoming sport. And so Fisher Skis, for example, they made race skis. So they're like, hey, do you want to try this ski cross thing? So I just gave it a go. And actually, I really, really enjoyed it. It was so fun to be in the gate side by side with people. It was such an intense moment, you know, and just like blasting under the gate and kind of like throwing your elbows up. I really, really enjoyed it. You know, the, the one thing that surprised me there was you being sponsored by Fisher. So how does that whole thing work out? Because you're in Whistler. It's after your mogul career. You're figuring out the whole park and pipe thing. You're doing well in your local contests. Does the Fisher rep come to you and hook you up, or how does that whole thing work out? No, it was all through this amazing guy named Hide Chiesu, and he's Japanese, and he was this photographer for Bravo Ski. And so he would do, like, the whole catalog for Bravo Ski. So he would get, like, bags of outerwear, and then he would get, like, a bunch of different skis. And so it was pretty funny. We would put on one kit in the morning. We'd go up. We'd go snap a couple photos. And then we would change out of that outerwear kit, put on a new outerwear kit, and then hit the quarter pipe, hit a jump a couple times. And then we would just, like, cycle through these kits throughout the whole day. And Hide was the kind of the guy who had all these connections back in Japan because of what he did. And he um, basically helped assemble this Gravity Fisher team. And so, yeah, I was just lucky enough to be able to get on the team with Zox and Turpin and Oakley. And so that's kind of what started my opportunity of being able to travel for big air. And so the first time I went to Japan, I think I was 19 and they just flew me out there on my own and put me up in this little uh, Airbnb. And I showed up at the big air the next day and there was this guy named Eric Pollard and Mike Nick there and, <laughs> and I really didn't have much of a, a bag of tricks at that point but I had a switch backflip man probably inspired by flu that day and that ended up winning the event even though Pollard obviously he's got such great style he had this super dope misty five but I think the snow was just kind of it was super soft and warm and I guess my switch back he just kind of it was a crowd pleaser back then god you must have felt like you made it like you got a sponsor, you're in Japan, you're competing against these guys, you're winning contests. Like, it has to feel like at 19 years old that your ski dreams are coming true or have come true. Oh, yeah. No, definitely, man. I remember I came back home. I think I had a couple grand at that point. And a big bottle of sake. I brought a bunch of beer back. And, yeah, I came back to Whistler. And, yeah, I guess it's, it's kind of hard to explain that feeling, you know, when things just start falling into place. Yeah, I would think it's like a relief where you don't have to worry about people thinking that you're not going to make anything of your life. And soon they're going to be like, holy shit, look at what he's doing. Yeah, you know, I think at that point it was still so early on. You know, I can't say that I was making it because I was still only like bringing home a couple grand. And then during those photo shoots, I was making a couple hundred bucks a day. But at least I was, you know, I was able to start making a bit of cash where I could keep a roof over my head and, and feed myself. So, yeah, it just felt good to know that things were starting to move in the right direction where I wasn't having to pay to ski, but now I was being paid to ski to a certain extent. It's time for my second round of sponsors, and I'm going to start things out with Alpine Vans. Alpine Vans is your one-stop shop for your dream adventure mobile. If you haven't checked out the Cody Townsend van video on their homepage, watch it, and you're going to see why Alpine Vans are leaps and bounds ahead of the competition, which is why they only have two vans left to build out this season. 
and they have big, big plans for next year. So if you want to get one of those two vans that they have left, well, head over to alpinevans.com and fill out their thoughtful quote builder and questionnaire. Well, I can't guarantee you'll get one of the last two practical, durable, easy to use vans that they have in stock. It's worth a try. And if you don't get one, I recommend holding out for next fall. And that's all I can really say because Alpine Vans has big plans, but they won't let me tell you about them until the fall. So check out Alpine Vans, see what they're able to do, and hold tight until you can get your hands on one of those vehicles. My next sponsor is Stanley, and they invented the category of keeping things hot and cold back in 1913. You know, that green bottle that your grandpa used to keep his coffee hot? That's a Stanley. Well, they still make that green bottle, and it still keeps your coffee hotter than their competition, but they also make so much more. I'm a huge fan of the pint glasses and think everyone needs a set. They keep beer or non-alcoholic beverages ice cold for hours. And their food storage options make parking lot meals at the resort so much easier. And they have so much more than that. And I'm going to save you 30% on everything. All you need to do is head on over to Stanley1913.com, go shopping, and enter the code DRINKFAST. That's all one word, all lowercase when you check out. Orders of $75 or more, you're going to get yourselves a free Powell Movement beanie while supplies last. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. I feel like you have a fairy godfather as well in Anthony Boronowski, where like yes. a lot of skiers helped shape you early on. But I think Anthony is the one dude who helped you in so many ways. And when you look back, what did that dude do for you back then that you can look at today and be like, thank you so much, Anthony? Oh, so much. Yeah, I guess there's a couple of things he did for me was one being we went on a road trip and he had this hilarious little Subaru. It's like a two-door Subaru. I had never actually seen this car on the road since then, but I remember we drove down to Super Park in Mammoth, and along the way, we stopped through Mount St. Helens, actually, and we met up with Kurt Heine, who was filming for Four Boys. And so along this road trip, we hit up St. Helens. We did a little shoot there, and then we went to Mount Hood, met up with TGR, did a little shoot there for salad days. <laughs> and then we continued on down to, to Mammoth and went to Super Park. And then he introduced me to Mike Goot from K2. Just right there, that trip is like... Massive. Paving a way for a career for you right there. It's like you're getting exposed to two different movies. And you're yeah. meeting a brand that is at that point, arguably one of the most important brands in the new school of skiing. And yeah. you're right there in the beginning. You also live with Anthony, too. Totally. And it was pretty funny because I remember, you know, I filmed with Poor Boys a little bit during that trip and I was kind of thinking I might be in a movie and I was, but I was in the credits. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think in salad days I had, I don't know, maybe three or four shots, but it was three or four shots. At that point, there weren't many movies. So if you had a shot or two in the movie, people that cared were going to see it for sure. A hundred percent. Yeah, it was something, you know, and then that following winter. Yeah, Anthony invited me to move in to live in a house with JP and Julian. And I remember him asking me, he's like, yo, how much are you making from skiing? I was like, well, really, I'm not making anything right now. He's like, nothing? I'm like, no, I mean, I'm coaching right now. And I might make you know a bit of cash at a competition, but I'm not making anything. And he saw how I was kind of being held back because I was having to work in order to pay rent and whatnot. And so that's when he really stepped up and he said, yo, I'll pay rent for you for the rest of the winter so that you can dedicate more time to skiing. That's so cool. It was amazing. He's like, I know you're going to work for, for High North again this summer. You can just pay me back after you finish putting your work in this summer. And so just by not having to pay rent, that just opened up that many more days for me to be able to get up on the hill. And it was pretty rad because JP, Julian... Or Anthony, you know, they were all traveling a lot then. And so quite often, one or two of them would be out of town, which meant there was an extra snowmobile in the driveway. Oh, nice. Yeah. So that's kind of what allowed me to be able to start getting out there. Because I remember when I rolled into Whistler, I had this dream of being a pro skier. And I bought this piece of shit sled called, uh, I think we called it Franken sled. It was literally covered in duct tape and stitched up with tie wire. It just says, hey, I'm a dirtbag. Yeah, totally. And I thought it was so rad because whatever, it was a snowmobile. And my friend Donnie Ellis, who's a pro snowboarder, he saw this snowmobile sitting in the back of the trailer. He's like, bro, that's not going to work, man. 
<laughs> it's like there's no paddles on this thing. It's too small of an engine. It barely runs. And so thankfully, between Anthony, JP, and Julian, they all had good snowmobiles. And thankfully, they loaned me their sleds. And so I was able to start flailing it around. And and as you know, like learning snowmobiling is not an easy task. You're you're getting stuck all the time. You're rolling it. But nonetheless, it was a start. I'm terrible. I always want to like cry when I'm doing it, when I get it buried. And I don't think I'm ever going to be able to get it out. So I don't do it that much anymore. <laughs> no, everybody thinks it's the easy way to get out there. And yes, once you get good at it, it is easier. But it's definitely not easy by any means. Like those are the days where... I'm probably more tired than any other days is after a long sled day. And when you're going sledding with someone else, like I did at the back nine, I was sledding with Dave Treadway. We were both on the sled doing tandem, going like 90K an hour. And it's just some scary shit as well when you're doing that. At least it was for me. Oh, 100%. Yeah. It's, uh, high-speed crashes are never fun, and it happens. Have you been in a high-speed crash in your sled? Yeah, totally. You know, it's weird because sleds, they're not that great on groomed roads. The skis are just kind of hooky. And so I've definitely had it a couple of times where all of a sudden, you know, you're hauling ass trying to get out to the zone as fast as possible and your, your ski just kind of hooks up. Just like you catch an edge when you're skiing? Yeah, totally. So, you, you know, I've fallen off and then meanwhile, my sled goes flying off the side of the road. And yeah, I mean, high speed crashes never feel good. Yeah, no, no. And then there's hitting trees and, you know, your sled falling off cliffs and there's so many epics. Thankfully, there's helicopters out there that can uh, get your snowmobile out of these complicated situations. Have you had to long line your, your sled before? Yes, I have. Yep. What's that story? <laughs> well, it wasn't... <laughs> my friend Dan's going to laugh if he listens to this, but a buddy of mine came out from LA for my birthday a few years ago, and I had two sleds at that point, so he borrowed my one, and we went deep. We went, <laughs> we went super far. And we had this massive hill climb to get out. Anyhow, we got to the bottom of the hill climb. He's like, I got this. I'm like, all right, buddy, if you're feeling it, go for it. And he made it up a quarter of the way and rolled the sled. And we rolled the sled over and the key was gone. We're like, what the? Oh. <laughs> yeah, so we were like digging around, digging around, digging around. We couldn't find the key after an hour. So we eventually, we had to leave it there. And so, of course, we had to yeah, get a helicopter to come and pick it up and fly it out of there. But it was pretty funny because it was like about a week later. I pulled the cover off the sled because when the sled had rolled, there was snow just packed all around the handlebars. Yep. And then by the time I had taken the cover off, the snow had melted. The key was actually jammed like into the handlebar. Oh, like into the rubber? Yeah, yeah, totally. Oh, that was a bit of a frustrating moment. Knowing that we had just, or I'd flown this heli up. Meanwhile, the key had been there the whole time. Oh, what a bummer. Well, yeah. we're going to jump back into the timeline. I think it's about like 2002 or 2003 is the time that I meet you. And it's in the cafeteria at K2 one fall day. And you were picking up product and gear. And I had no idea that you were an athlete. It was like you were so quiet. And the way that you carried yourself, I remember asking Goot when you left the building, hey, was that guy the new intern? And was <laughs> self-promotion kind of uncomfortable for you back then? Yeah, totally. I think because I was always... That guy that, yeah, I was just never the top dog, you know, and so. And you got hooked up by friends and stuff? Yeah, totally. And I don't know, I guess I was never really an outspoken person. Do you remember when I was talking about when you came down to K2 and you're in the cafeteria? No, I don't remember that, actually. You came to Bashan once? Yes, totally. Yeah. It was one time, right? Yeah, the one time. And then I think we went back when we did the. Um... Oh, Kiss Shoot. The kiss shoot and the beetle shoot. Because we couldn't do the kiss shoot. <laughs> but yeah, I think I was always a little bit more of a, a softer spoken person. And I definitely was not the greatest self-promoter. But you let your skiing do the talking for itself. So, I mean, it, was, it never really was a problem. But it just seemed like, and it seems like even today, it's like you're not the most comfortable with being on the internet saying, look at me, look at me, look at me all the time. But when you have something to put out, that's when you can say, look at me. You know, it's definitely something I've had to learn how to do. It's part of your job. Yeah, it was part of my job. And I didn't have an agent for the first 12 years or whatever. And so I kind of had to learn how to, in that moment, when I was speaking to a potential sponsor, learn how to tell them that, hey, I'm a hard worker. I'm going to do the very best that I can. And this is what I can do for you. And so that's when I really learned how to kind of find some of that confidence, and then learn how to speak that. And that took me a long time. 
So if that took you a long time, did the other sponsors that you had back then, the Smiths and the Sessions, did they come in through friends as well? Or was it something that you went out and sought? You know, I was lucky with Smith because Tag Kleiner used to come up to High North. Oh, yeah. And, you know, he just noticed me there. And so I think he just asked me, like, hey, do you have a Goggle sponsor? You know, and of course, I was just super giddy, you know, when you have somebody asking you that question, because, you know, I knew who he was. Right. And it's pretty amazing because I'm not even sure what year that was anymore. But Smith is definitely my longest standing sponsor, all starting with Tag. And then how did Sessions come into play back then? You know, I think that might have been through Shane McConkey. Well, that's a pretty rad introduction to get on Sessions through Shane. Yeah, no doubt. And that was such a rad sponsor, too, because I wasn't dealing with the team manager. I was dealing with Joel Gomez, who's the owner of Sessions. And just a legendary dude with so much history and so connected. Totally. And such a nice guy. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember driving out to Santa Cruz to go meet up with him. He just like gave me the whole tour through the office and took me to the surf breaks, took me to his house. And he like really welcomed me in as a part of the family. Even though I was like not a, a typical person for sessions, you know, I wasn't much of a skateboarder. I didn't really listen to punk music, but nonetheless, he welcomed me just for being me. You're the stocky Canadian who's going to be the new contest <laughs> kid. Totally, man. And that's the thing is you get on these brands and you have an epic season. You got like fourth and fifth at the U.S. Open and Slope and Big Air, which is a huge deal. Yeah, yeah. That competition definitely helped a lot. Like it opens everybody's eyes in the world because the U.S. Open at that point, it's got the biggest spotlight on it. The X Games is obviously the Olympics at that point. But the U.S. Open is where people make a name for themselves. And when you go there and you get fourth and fifth and no one knows who Mark Abma is before the weekend starts, after the weekend is over, that's a huge deal. And you end up with an invite to the X Games. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, prior to that, I was doing these smaller, more regional events. And yeah, congrats if you get on the podium, but it doesn't really say much in the bigger side of the sport of course yeah no one hears about your podium in bc over in maine yeah that's it exactly and then all of a sudden you know i'm standing in the the top of the gate or dropping in for big air you know alongside of you and olsen and whatnot so that definitely changed a lot of people's perspective on i guess my potential and I would think that U.S. Open, there's probably not as much nerves as just like excitement because you're like at the biggest stage you've ever been to, but you're not expected to do shit and you do really well. But when you get to that X Games, is it like the most stressful thing that you've ever been a part of before where there's all these cameras and all this stuff that you're not used to? You know, for me, it didn't really even matter too much whether it was a big event or a small event. I still always got just as nervous. Okay. It was just at that point... The features were maybe just a little bit more polished and a little bit bigger. And at the end of the day, I think like taking it back to visualization, I just kind of focused on that. And somewhere along the way, I'm not sure who introduced breathing to me, but that became a huge component with just learning how to relax myself at the top of the gate. Do you get starstruck at all when you're standing next to the Yoons of the world? Or maybe not even starstruck, just like, I can't believe I'm standing next to this dude who's so much better than me? Yeah, starstruck. And I think it kind of put me back into being that quiet kid again, you know, like I just felt like I wasn't worthy, you know, because I was never really a person that had the gift of the gab. I didn't really have that skill set just to walk up and go say what up, you know, and like go create a rapport with those kind of people. So I felt like I was always the kid on the sideline to a certain extent, even within like the social dynamic of the sport. So you just never felt like you were one of the cool kids almost? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I always felt like I was just off to the side and just kind of doing my own thing and just staying focused on what I was trying to do. How long into your career did it take for you to feel like you belonged? Uh, you know, I think it was maybe after yearbook when I went to Bella Coola and had that trip with McConkey, And, you know, I think that's when I really tapped into my superpower to a certain extent, you know, and with that, like really just kind of discovering myself and almost my purpose. And so I think as soon as I found my purpose, I found my place, you know, and so I think as soon as somebody steps into that part of themselves, then they find their voice to a certain extent. And then I think with that, all of a sudden, I started becoming just a little bit more accepted as well. Because prior to that, when you're just like another hungry kid, and there's lots of hungry kids out there, but you're not necessarily fully embraced yet. Right. So 
it takes a while in the sport to prove yourself. To almost stick. Yeah, totally. And so I remember that yearbook year, you know, like CR and Tanner, they finally kind of gave me the nod of approval, you know? That had to feel good. And that same spring, we had this film shoot in Whistler where Matchstick got those crazy circular style shots. Oh, yeah. The heli going around. That was the, I remember those. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. Heli's in the park shot. Yeah, exactly. And so CR, Tanner, and I, we were just hitting that jump together and Douglas was there. And those guys really respected the fact that I was skiing big mountains, but also still hitting park jumps. And it's kind of what they graduated into being. Totally. And of course, those guys, they were kind of the top dogs at that point. So I think once I got approval from them, that it, it just gave me some more confidence at that point. All right. Well, we're going to kind of slow this thing down because we're at a point where I feel like we have another hour, hour and a half to go. And I know that's a long time. And I want to break this thing up into two different podcasts. Are you OK with doing that? Oh, I'd love that, buddy. Awesome. man. Yeah, that'd be great. So what I do is I have a segment that I close out the podcast with. It's called Inappropriate Questions. Oh, boy. Yeah. And <laughs> I get someone that you know to ask you three questions, and they could be anything. All right. This week, I was able to get one Chris Turpin to ask you three questions. Oh, perfect. I know you've been working a lot with Chris <laughs> over the summers, and Chris has question number one. I'm going to queue it up for you right now. All right. Is it good to eat bad pork before competing? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> What's the story behind that? Yeah, so that U.S. Open, when I got fourth and fifth, Turpin and I were driving from Alberta down to Colorado and to save some cash and not buy food and fast food along the way. We decided to buy some bagels and cream cheese and some Black Forest ham. Okay. And uh, I thought that by throwing all the groceries in the Thule box, it would act as a cooler because it was a cold drive down, right? Yeah. So anyhow, we were doing our thing, eating along the way, and then we got down to Vail. And I remember that night I was getting hungry before the contest. So I decided to make a bagel with cream cheese and some of this ham. And I remember putting the ham on the bagel. And I was like, well, it's kind of weird. It's got like a bit of a rainbow look to it, but whatever. <laughs> and I ate it. And oh, my gosh. Like within an hour or two, I was violently shitting. And my buddy Miles gave me the nickname Shower Shitter Abma because <laughs> I was shitting so much, I couldn't wet my butt anymore, man. It was the full burning ring of fire. And oh. so I just had to stand in the shower. And yeah, it was horrible. But I must have just like dropped a bunch of weight that night. And maybe it just kind of helped with my stomping legs the next morning. Because yeah, it ended up being a great event for me. <laughs> well, you should have done that every <laughs> event. Eat bad ham. Yeah, maybe. All right, we'll go with his second question. Pros and cons of not having smell. I'd say there's more pros than cons, personally. Except for in a gas leak. <laughs> Thankfully, I've got people around me that can smell when I've got propane leaks. But as far as pros, I can't smell farts, which is awesome. Not so great for people around me. <laughs> can't smell ski socks or ski boots, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess cons is I can't smell good food, you know? I can't smell freshly cut grass. So it's definitely something that I want to work on. I mean, I don't know how you work on it. I guess that's something you have to do with a doctor to be able to smell again. But knowing you, you'll probably figure out some kind of way of stretching thing and you're going to smell again. Totally. Actually, and you know what? I remember the BC team boys, they used to always mess with me. And maybe I was the stinky kid, but they always called me the stinky kid, you know? And so <laughs> to make you self conscious <laughs> and you could never figure it out. Yeah, totally. And I was like, uh, well, I might be the stinky kid. I don't know. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> All right. I would say we'd go to his third and final question, but I just remember that Chris came up with five questions when most people come up with three. So I'm going to go with his third question. All right. Whitewater log rafting, any tips? Oh, my God. Whitewater log rafting. I don't even know what that is. Yeah, don't do it, man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Turpin and I, we were getting to, and you might remember this from back in the day, but I was hopping on inner tubes and going down... <laughs> these whitewater sections through Whistler. Yeah, I do remember that vaguely. Yeah, it was some random sport. I, I don't know where I got the idea for it, but it was, it was super fun. But just by nature, these tubes that I was using were designed for going behind boats, which they're not designed for going down rivers because they fill with water and they start to sink after a while. Okay. And so Turpin was there, you know, being the good guy that he is. 
entertaining this idea and we lost our tubes. So then we had to go running down the embankment of the river to go find our tubes. And eventually we got to a section of the river where there was no more embankment. It was just a cliff. But we noticed that there was a log kind of stuck in this little log jam. We're like, well, let's just go hop in that log and then we'll start floating down the river until we find our inner tubes. Yeah. So we hop on this log and we start floating down. We're having an awesome time. But I mean, this is a high volume river, the Chequemus, which is a pretty substantial river in Whistler. It's well known for kayaking. Not the safest thing to do. No, not smart at all. And eventually we get to the section of the river where the river just hits a hard 90, like hits a rock wall. And I remember hopping off at that point, knowing that it wasn't going to be good. And I think Turpin ended up hanging onto the log, but there was like an undertow there. And so Turpin and the log got pulled under the river. And I remember treading water, looking around and not seeing my homie. Oh, man. And I'm not sure how long he was underwater for, but it was definitely, you know, it felt like minutes. Oh, man. Yeah. And eventually he popped up. So we, uh, we abandoned the inner tubes and definitely we never returned to hopping on a log down a river again. <laughs> was that the end of that sport for you? It was. It was the end of an era. Yeah. I mean, you thought you might lose your friend doing something stupid. <laughs> oh, yeah. hundred percent. But uh, it's pretty rad that Turpin and I, you know, we're, we're still adventuring together. And I'm sure we'll talk more about that in the next one. We definitely will. We're going to go with this fourth question. Drinking for free. How do you pull it off? And what are the pros and cons? <laughs> it sounds like drinking for free would have no cons. But what are the cons? <clears throat> well, drinking for free, that was a thing for a while because I was broke for a number of years. But, you, you know, you want to go out with your buddies and everybody's going out to the bars. So, yep, I'm not proud of it, but I was definitely that guy that's going around scooping half empty drinks. <laughs> 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 and I would say the cons of it is that you're just drinking whatever you can get your hands on. And, you know, mixing drinks is never a good idea. But that just is a tribute to the... That's, it's a tribute to the ski bum lifestyle, really. Yeah, totally. <laughs> you know, it's like you're doing whatever it takes, you know, like for food. I was surviving off rice and mushroom soup. And for drinks, I was surviving off of free drinks, you know, or whatever my buddies would be willing to pick up for me. Man, well, you know, it's the struggle that got you to where you were today. <laughs> so it worked out. But it's just funny to think that you were in that position. But, you know, a oh, lot of Oh, not a are... proud moment, man. No, for sure. I look back and I'm just like, you know, slapping my forehead. I'm like, really, buddy? That's what you're doing? But that's what it takes. But hey, you know what? It was fun while it lasted. That's for sure. Yeah, and that's what it took to get you where you are today. So that's part of it. I mean, <laughs> it's all part of the journey. That's it. For sure. Here's your final inappropriate question What's the worst beer you've ever had or th thought you were drinking? Oh, <laughs> uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of guessing he's referring to a moment. And this was shortly after our amazing friend Josh Duick broke his back. And he was in a, he became paraplegic and he was in a wheelchair. And that summer, he came out to Whistler and we went to Lost Lake and we were drinking some beers and he had a catheter. So, you know, I wasn't really monitoring which bottles he was using his catheter with. But I don't know, at the end of the night, me <laughs> being the same guy, you know, just like picking up half empty bottles. <laughs> I was like, oh, there's you know, somebody didn't drink their beer. So I tipped up the bottle and it turned out to be a bottle of Josh's piss. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you throw up right there? No, I've got an iron gut. So I, I swallowed it, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there was another moment where another good friend of mine actually intentionally had me drink piss. And that was Anthony Bornowski at the end of one summer. We were hanging out at Savage Beagle. And oh, what was the deal there? Yeah, we couldn't go downstairs. We couldn't use the bathrooms. So people were just sticking it out, just hanging out up top, and people were pissing in the bar. Anyhow, Anthony was like giving me a cheers. He's like, yo, man, I got you a drink. You know, it's been such a great year hanging out with you. I love you so much. And he like cheers me and gave me a, like a rebel, what I thought was vodka. <laughs> <laughs> and I later found out the next day, everybody's like, yo, I heard you drank piss, man. <laughs> and you can't taste that well because you can't smell. I guess not. Yeah. So I guess he made me a Red Bull and there was no vodka. It was just piss. Oh, Red Bull piss, man. <laughs> That's awesome and disgusting. I still owe him for that. Uh, you know, I was conspiring for years trying to figure out how I would get Anthony back for that. You can't get him back. He like helped make your career. I know. I just sucked it up, man. Yeah. <laughs> 
too nice. I'm too nice of a guy, I guess. Right. <laughs> Small price to pay. All right, Adma. Well, I want to thank you for your time here in part one of this podcast. And I think we should connect in the next two to three weeks to get part two done. And then we're going to put them out in the very beginning of the year. You're going to be the first podcast of 2022. I hope you're going to be Rad. the first two podcasts. It's been awesome watching your career because I feel like I was there at K2 in the cafeteria to see you there. And I watched from the sidelines and then you blew up. And it was like, hey, that's that quiet kid. <laughs> Totally, man. And we're going to talk about more about your life and times and all the exciting stuff that happened. But thanks for your time, and I will talk to you soon, man. Rad. Thanks so much, buddy. So that was part one with Mark Abma, and I did this podcast before Christmas. And honestly, I don't even remember what we talked about in part one. But if I have to have a takeaway, it's that Mark Abma works a lot harder than almost anyone. And that's why he is where he is today. I mean, it sounds like his talent level wasn't even top tier in the beginning, but hard work can and will overcome that. And on part two of the podcast, we dive into some of the unique things that make Mark Abma Abma, as well as hitting on some more ski-related topics. At this point, I want to thank you for listening and introduce the review of the week. This week, it comes from Rye VCT. The review is titled Best Action Sports Related Podcast, period. It's a five-star review. It's short and sweet. Here's the review. See title. Seriously, though, does his homework better than anyone else. Style is on point and voice is easy to listen to. Not super annoying and not trying to play up broness like two. Give this a listen so we can keep it going. I thank you, Rye VCT, for that review. I like the short and sweet ones that make me feel good about myself and I like that my voice is easy to listen to. I think it's the first time anybody's ever said that. So I thank you very much for that. If you email me at mike at thepowellmovement.com, I will send you a beanie. For anybody else that wants a beanie, submit an iTunes review or leave a review on social media. If I read the review on the show, you're a winner. Thanks for that. And my last ask of you is to rate me on Spotify. And it's really easy to do that. First, go to Spotify and listen to a couple episodes of the podcast. Second, search for the Powell Movement again and click my logo. Third, tap on the star review area. Fourth, give me the star rating that you think I deserve. And I thank you a ton for doing it. It's super easy to review me on Spotify. And I'm hoping that this helps to show growth through this important platform. Finally, thank you so much for continuing to listen. And please support my amazing sponsors who make this thing happen. They are Stanley, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, Elon Skis, Alpine Vans, and the Ten Barrel Brewery. Have a great week, everyone. <laughs>